but as high schoolers. You have just a few years and some of you a few months until you could potentially be leaving your home to start a new life. And while this isn't guaranteed, I imagine most of you will live with different people after this, whether it be roommates in college or maybe some close friends. Since I graduated high school, I've had over 15 different roommates and I now live with my wife, Taylor. And I can tell you that I've learned a couple things over the years. One, relationships take work. And two, everybody has things in their life that are so familiar to them that they don't even realize it until you start to live with somebody else. For example, we are currently standing in my living room and what do you see behind me? Here's what I see. I see a really great couch with a lot of space to sit. And then I also see some of my stuff that I use today that I'll probably leave there uh, because I'm gonna use it again tomorrow. Now, you know what Taylor sees? Taylor sees just a bunch of junk on the couch that now is on YouTube Live in a video for everybody to see and they're gonna think that we are slobs. Now, who's right about this? Well, most people, my mom included, would probably see Taylor, would probably say Taylor. Because here's something that I've learned over the years. For my entire life, I have created piles everywhere I go that consist of things that I use frequently or things that I know I'm gonna have to use later that day so that I know where to find them so that it's convenient for me. And so now that I'm married, I'm realizing that I constantly have to think about where I'm putting my stuff and what I'm doing in order to keep the peace in my home. Because I'll tell you, when I walk in the room, I don't see these piles. Now we are in week two of a series called Awkward in which we're having the awkward conversations about relationships and about dating and about everything in between. And I share this story with you about my piles because I think the way we think about the piles in our life is very similar to the way we think about relationships and sex in our world. You see, we live in a culture that is saturated with messages about sex and relationships on social media, or it's all over the words and the songs on the radio or the storylines of our favorite shows. Sex is everywhere. And when something becomes so familiar to us, it is easy to not even think twice about it as it becomes a casual, natural part of our everyday life. However, sex and relationships are way too of important of a thing to just become another pile in our lives. And here's why I believe that. As a church, we believe that relationships and sex are great things that God created so that we can experience joy, that we can experience connection, and so much more. And also I'll tell you that there are few things in life that affect our entire being more than relationships or sex. I mean, have you heard the song Driver's License on the radio? And that song is um, such an, an amazing song that just makes you want to sing, but also You'll notice that when you listen to that song, you can't help but feel the emotion and the pain in her voice as she belts out the chorus. And then when she ends it saying the words, cause you say forever, now I drive alone right past your street, we feel her pain. Because if you've ever been in a relationship that ended, you know that pain. At the same time, you also know the joy that comes from feeling in love. Relationships can bring this pain and also this joy. And when something has the ability to affect our emotions or our lives so positively or so negatively, we should always stop to pay attention. So tonight, we're going to do just that. And I want to say a couple things up front. First, as a church, we believe that God's intent for sex is that it is to be reserved for a long-term marriage commitment. Second, I want to make it clear that our goal in life is not one day to get married or one day to have sex. Sometimes when the church can talk about marriage or sex, we can talk about it as though this is sort of like the end goal in life. That once you reach this point, you're going to feel complete. But again, that couldn't be further from the truth. 
As a follower of Jesus, our goal in life is to love Jesus and to find wholeness and completion in Jesus alone. And if you haven't found that, I will tell you that being married or being, a, being in a relationship is going to continue longing and looking for more. So if you're single and you're watching this or you couldn't even care less about dating, I want you to know that is completely okay. There is nothing wrong with you and being in a relationship isn't going to change anything about you. As we talk tonight about living with sexual integrity, this idea applies to every single one of us, whether we're single, dating, and even someday in the future if you get married. So tonight we're going to take a look back at a verse that we introduced last week in Romans chapter 12. And in Romans 12, Paul is writing to a group of people in Rome who also are hearing different messages about what is normal in life, and uh, kind of they're hearing a new message about Jesus that kind of stands against the thing that they thought was just their normal practices. And so as they're hearing these messages, all of a sudden these piles that they had just sort of been living with are coming front and center as they're forced to ask the question, what are we doing now? Or how do we deal with this? So in Romans chapter 12, Paul says this. He says, do not be conformed by the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Therefore, you can test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Paul is never really one to dance around the point, and he gets right to it right here, and he says there are kind of two different ways of thinking. There's a pattern of the world that is the way that the world thinks, the people around you live. But there's also this way of life that's God's will. And if you want to know where you should live or what is the right thing to do, you need to understand what God's will is and to see the patterns of this world in light of that. So in this conversation that we're having today, I think it's important for us to stop and ask, what is the patterns in this world when it comes to sex and dating. Well, here are some messages that I often have heard or hear from some of you. One is that sex is just something that happens and it's part of the moment. Or another message is this, that, I mean, if you're in love or if you've been together for a really long time, it's actually kind of weird if you don't have sex. Or in a, maybe another different direction, another message that we could hear is that when you hear a joke or maybe when someone sends you a picture, it's not really that big of a deal. I mean, if you hear a joke that's funny, it's funny. It doesn't matter how inappropriate it is. If I were to sum up the messages in our culture when it comes to sex, it's this. Sex is casual. So if, if that's the thought... What, if anything, is wrong with that? Well, again, in this passage, Paul is introducing two different ways of thinking. There's the patterns of the world, then there's God's will. So if we want to know if this idea that sex is casual is something that maybe we should think, think differently about, we should understand what exactly is God's will. And, you know, isn't that question of what is God's will the question that we're often asking in every part of our lives? Well, Paul gives us a little glimpse of what that is when we jump down to verse 10 in chapter 12. Paul says this. He says, Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. You know, when you hear this passage, you might hear echoes to the words that Jesus said when somebody asked him, Jesus, what is the most important commandment? And Jesus says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. You know, my wife Taylor, her family has two white goldens. Their names are Bear and Callie. And the second you visit them, the second you go through the front door, Bear and Callie will immediately grab their favorite toy and they will bring it to you. And I believe if they could talk, what they would say to you is, you are my best friend. Here is my favorite toy. I want you to have it because you deserve it. It doesn't matter what has happened that day. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't even matter if you deserve it. To Baron Callie, you are the honored guest. 
Therefore, you deserve their toys. I believe what Paul is saying when he talks about God's will is that when it comes to our relationships, treat one another like Baron Callie. Honor them. Lift them up. Let them know that they have value. So what's God's will? God's will is that in every situation, we love God, and we love and respect others. In our relationships, we call this living with sexual integrity. We introduced this idea of sexual integrity last, what, last week, and what it means is taking the sexual things we think, feel, and desire and respond to them in a way that chooses to honor God and others in how you think about, treat, value, and respect the people that you date. Now with that in mind, Let's go back to the patterns of this world that we mentioned earlier, that sex is casual. When something is casual, how do we treat it? Well, again, let's use this idea of Bear and Callie. If I were casual to Bear and Callie, what would they, or how would they treat me? Well, I imagine when I walked into the room, they, they would probably acknowledge my existence. Maybe they'd look up. I'm sure they would wag their tails a little bit or that they'd come around if they want food or attention. But everything ultimately would be about them. And it would be about their timing. I would simply be another part of their life. When sex causes us, or when sex is casual, we might think, you know, that thing was just a hookup. Or, it's just a picture. Or even, you know, we're in love. But the reality is, is like when we're thinking about the things, what those are actually about, it's about what is good for me or what is good for us right here and right now. Sexual integrity, on the other hand, sees things differently. Sexual integrity asks us to see one another as people created with worth and with value who deserve to be respected, not just now, but in their future relationships as well. You see, when we live with sexual integrity, we see that sex isn't casual no matter how casually it's treated because God calls us to treat every single human being with honor and to respect who they are, and who they will become. And I want you to know that the same goes for the way people treat you. If someone doesn't treat you with respect and honor, if someone isn't living with sexual integrity in the way that they're responding to you, they don't deserve you. You deserve to be honored and valued because you are a loved child of God. So what does all this mean for us today? And if we are to be people who live with sexual integrity, how do we shift our minds to become those types of people? Well, first, let me say this. Becoming a person of sexual integrity doesn't happen overnight. It isn't a quick and easy process. In fact, it's a lifelong process that takes practice and discipline. And because it's a lifelong process, there'll probably be some ups and downs. And it is so, so important that our very first step is to receive God's grace. Because, man, we need it. I want you to know that if you are feeling any shame over things that you have done in the past, there is no judgment here. You are welcome here. And every single one of us has done something that we regret. Every one of us has done something we aren't proud of or something we wish we would have thought more through than we actually did. But this is a place for you. Shame makes us hide and it tells us the lie that we aren't good enough. But Paul tells us in Romans 8.1 that therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Basically that because of who Jesus is and what Jesus did for us on the cross, we do not need to live in fear or shame, but instead we are invited to live in the freedom of Jesus' grace and forgiveness. If there is something 
that you're holding on to, a shame that you're feeling or a weight that you're carrying, I want to invite you to pause right now and to give that to Jesus. Receive Jesus' grace and forgiveness. Now, once you've done that, we are now free to focus on moving forward. So confession time. I still leave piles all over my couch and floor. This pile right here wasn't just set up for the talk. It was part of my day. And for me to actually change this way of living, I need to actually bring myself to start noticing the piles in order to start the hard work of changing my habit. If I don't, nothing is ever going to change, and my relationship with Taylor will probably get worse. So the next thing for us to do is to begin to notice our own piles in our life. What are, what are the piles or the messages that you hear about sex that you actually no longer really think about or even notice? You owe it to yourself to think critically about how much cultural messages affect you. Start paying attention to the ways that culture influences your thinking so that you can begin to make changes. And finally, Paul says this. He says, to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Changing how your mind works isn't easy. But here are some tips that can be helpful as our minds begin to be transformed. The first is memorize scripture. You know, what we focus on shapes the way we think and how we think about things. This is why this month we're challenging people to memorize Romans 12, 1 and 2. The more we focus on God's word, the more that will begin to transform our minds and influence the way we live our lives. A second thing is that maybe there's a pattern that has created some secrets that are slowly hurting you. I know this one could be extra difficult because it is going to mean sharing it with somebody else. But sometimes the absolute best way to change your thinking is to talk about, talk about it with someone who is older and wiser and maybe more experienced than you. While it might be challenging, it will be so relieving for you to share what you are going through. To have somebody else take that burden off of your shoulders and to let you know, I'm in this with you and I'm not going to leave you alone. And they can help you begin to change your thought process. What is it in your life that you would like to see Jesus begin to start transformation in you? Invite God's Spirit to work in your life and begin the process of transforming your mind. Now I want to encourage you to come back next week as we continue this conversation together. And as we do that, we're going to actually going to have a panel and we want to be able to answer any questions that you may have. So check out the link in the video description in order to submit anonymous questions for the chance that you will hear your question answered next week. And as we close, I want to remind you that you are not alone in this. As awkward as these conversations could be, we have life group leaders who want to walk with you, and we have life groups to also join you in this process. And I'm praying for you this week as you enter into these conversations with your life group, and you begin to let the grace and love of Jesus work in your life. If you don't have a life group, join me in the New Student After Party as we get going. See you soon, and have a great week.